breakfast at 9 this Tuesday the 23rd of July 2024 coming soon the Gazette notification with presidential election dates to be issued within the week reveals the election commission bury the past Sri Lankan government to apologize to the communities affected by the compulsory cremation policy during the COVID pandemic head held high Sri Lanka should be mindful to protect its sovereignty amidst the rapidly changing geopolitical landscape, warns former Australian Prime Minister. Amendments Draft bill to amend the Online Safety Act with expert suggestions to be presented to Parliament for approval. From Adhaderana, this is Adhaderana First at Nine. From Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to Sri Lanka's premier primetime English news bulletin, other there on a first at nine. I'm Tarindu Mahendra, joining you with the latest in Sri Lanka and around the world. Now, the Election Commission revealed that the Gazette notification in relation to the upcoming presidential election will be issued before this weekend. Against this backdrop, a crucial meeting of the Election Commission is scheduled to be held next Thursday, during which the date of the presidential poll is expected to be confirmed. The upcoming presidential election is the most prominent topic of discussion in the political field and among civil society. Accordingly, a crucial meeting of the Election Commission, where decisions will be made over the upcoming presidential election, is scheduled to be held next Thursday at the Election Commission premises. The date on which the presidential election will be held and other matters pertaining to the election will be discussed during the meeting. Following the meeting, the date of the presidential poll will be announced. A spokesperson for the Election Commission stated that the Gazette notification in relation to the presidential election will be published before this weekend. Meanwhile, Commissioner General of the Election Commission, Saman Sri Ratnayaka, who attended the conference in Colombo yesterday, expressed his opinions regarding the upcoming presidential election. During the elections, the highest cost will be incurred by the Postal Department, Police and the Department of Government Printing. The Postal Department incurs a large cost due to the system of postal voting. Presently, the Postal Department has called in tenders to purchase supplies required for the election. They usually purchase supplies sufficient for two years from the funds allocated to them for election operations. It is pivotal that we analyze the cost incurred by Sri Lanka police and the government printing department. We have often request Auditor General's department to look into these expenses. We have to closely examine the expenses of the elections. At the end of the day, all these expenses will be considered as part of the election expenses. Additionally, if there is an increase in the number of candidates for the election, we might have to print a two-column ballot paper. A ballot paper is 27 inches long. The ballot paper printed for the previous election was 26 inches long. 35 candidates contested the previous election. If the number of candidates increases by five, a two-column ballot paper would have been printed. All these cannot be printed in one column. Therefore, we have to change the format and print the names in two columns. Crunchy goodness for hunger on the go. Ministers Kanchana Vijay Sekara and Prasanna Ranatunga reiterated that Sri Lanka Podu Jana Peramuna should support President Ranil Vikramasinghe at the upcoming presidential election, adding that he deserves another tenure as the president. They made these comments while addressing media following a party meeting with former President Mahinda Rajapaksa at the Sri Lanka Podu Jana Party headquarters in Bhattaramulla. A meeting with the parliamentarians representing the government was held at the president's house under the patronage of President Ranil Vikramasinghe. While extending his appreciation to the Sri Lanka Pudujana Peramuna led by former President Mahindra Rajapaksa for supporting him in governing the country during the past two years, President Vikramasinghe affirmed that the presidential election, for which funds have already been allocated, will be held as planned. He added that the country is unable to hold a parliamentary election this year. Meanwhile today, former President Mahinda Rajapaksa chaired a meeting with members of the Sri Lanka Pudjana Perimuna at the party headquarters in Nelumautha to discuss the preparations with regard to the upcoming presidential election. 
පක්ෂය මේ වෙලාවේ කිව්වේ ජනාධිපතිවරයා නම් කර විගස අපේක්ෂකයන්ගෙන් ඉල්ලීම් ලැබුණාට පස්සේ දේශපාලන මණ්ඩලයේ තීන්දුව ගන්නවා කියන එක. ඔහුතුම ගේ අදහස කිව්වද? රනිල් වික්‍රමසිංහ මැතිතුමාට නැවත වතාවක් ලබා දිය යුතුයි කියන මතේ ඉන්නවා. දැන් මේ කාංචන විජේසේකර මැතිතුමා නම් කිව්වේ බහුතර කැමැත්ත වගේ තියෙන්නේ ජනාධිපතිතුමාට සහාය දෙන්න කියලා. මැතිතුමාල හිතන් ඉන්නවා එතන බහුතර මතේ තියෙනවා කියලා. තව කට්ටියක් හිතන් ඉන්නවා එතුමා නොවෙන්න ඕනේ කියලා. එයා හිතන් ඉන්නවා ඒ අයට බහුතර මතේ තියෙනවා කියලා. ඉතින් අපි සාකච්ඡා කරලා විස්තුමක් දෙන්නා. රනිල් වික්‍රමසිංහ මහත්මයා මේ රටේ ජනාධිපති වෙන්න ඕනේ. නම විශ්වාස කරනවා පක්ෂ හරි තීන්දුවක් හරි වෙලාවට ගන්න. සර් කොහොමද මේ අපේක්ෂකයා පොහොට්ටු වෙන්නේ මොකද වෙන්නේ ඇත්තටම මොකද වෙන්නේ? අපි ඉතින් තාම තීන්දු කරේ නැහැ කවුද අපේක්ෂකයා කියලා. වෙලාවට හරියට අපේක්ෂකයා ඉදිරිපත් කරනවා. පොහොට්ටු වෙම කෙනෙක්ද දාන්නේ? ඔව් වෙන්න පුළුවන්. මේ රනිල් වික්‍රමසිංහ මහත්මයා නේද අනිවාර්යෙන් පොහොට්ටු වෙන්නේ? නෑ. Horizon Campus 2024 intake. Register now. Leader of the National People's Power, Anura Kumara Disanayake, requests the Sri Lankan business community residing in Japan to invest in Sri Lanka in order to develop the nation. Addressing an event in Japan, the NPP leader highlighted that the country will never achieve economic development if the existing political culture continues to persist and affirms that the NPP-led government will put an end to the corrupt political tradition. Leader of the National People's Power, Anur Kumar Dzanayake, who is currently on a visit to Japan, met with the Sri Lankan business community in the Japanese capital, Tokyo. At the moment, most political parties urge Sri Lankans residing abroad to remain there while they take care of the country's affairs. However, since all of you contribute significantly to the country's economy, you have the right to be informed of the country's government and its policies. Speaking of his visit to Qatar, President Ranil Vikramasinghe said that the people of Qatar used to live in shanties and shacks in the past, but it achieved a remarkable feed development. He asked why Sri Lanka cannot do the same. However, they have to accept the fact that our country failed to keep up with the pace of technological advancement. A modern economic journey is imperative for this country to develop. The country's political culture needs to be transformed. This political tradition of the country often disrupts businesses as well as investments brought into the country. It also disrupts government revenue streams. How much of the government's revenue is being misspent without being allocated appropriately? However, an NPP-led government will put to an end to this corrupt political tradition. This is crucial for the development of the economy. Since all of you have become strong entrepreneurs, you can borrow funds from the Japanese banks at a low interest rate. I request you to invest those funds in Sri Lanka in order to develop our country. I assure you that we don't require any personal benefits from any of you. However, it is imperative that all of us make an effort to develop a country which has been labelled bankrupt. Cabinet approved the proposal that the government should apologise to the communities affected by the compulsory cremation policy enforced in Sri Lanka during the COVID-19 pandemic. The decision was made during the cabinet meeting that was held last evening. Further, the cabinet also approved the proposal to instruct the legal draftsman to prepare a draft to introduce a new act on burial or cremation of dead bodies on religious discretion. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in Sri Lanka in early 2020, which back then was spreading rapidly across the world, the government has adhered to a policy to cremate the remains of those who succumbed due to the virus after Sri Lankan health authorities raised concerns that the bodies of the COVID-19 victims would contaminate the groundwater if they were buried. However, this policy drew criticism from organizations including the United Nations and human rights NGOs and anger from minority communities in Sri Lanka, mainly the Muslims, as burial is an integral part of their final rights. Taking the criticisms into account, a nine-member expert panel headed by Professor Jennifer Pereira was appointed to examine the methods for disposal of COVID-19 victims and an 11-member technical committee headed by consultant forensic pathologist Dr. Channa Pereira to study the recommendations of the expert panel was appointed by the government in 2020. Following the committee recommendations, the government in February 2021 allowed burials of the victims who had succumbed due to COVID, marking an end to the forced cremation that had continued for months since the beginning of the pandemic. Iranathiwailan in the Gulf of Manaa and Oddamawad in Batiklo were designated as burial sites. 
Even though the government ended the forced cremation policy, it continuously came under criticism even in the aftermath. Later, several groups, including parliamentarians representing both the government and the opposition, criticized the forced cremation policy, highlighting its serious consequences for multi-ethnic Sri Lankan society and the island nation's relations with the Middle East. In parliament this month, President Ranil Vikramasinghe, who apologized for the government's decision to enforce cremations during the COVID-19 pandemic, added that any person in Sri Lanka should have the right to determine whether his or her remains are buried, cremated or given to the medical faculty. Against such a backdrop, a joint paper submitted by Minister of Justice Dr. Vijay Das Rajapaksa, Minister of Foreign Affairs Ali Sabri and Minister of Water Supply and State Infrastructure Development Jeevan Thondaman, highlighting that the government should apologize to the communities affected by the government's compulsory cremation policy was approved at the cabinet meeting that was held last evening. Further, the cabinet also approved the proposal to instruct the legal draftsman to prepare a draft to introduce a new act on burial or cremation of dead bodies on religious discretion. Vivida Viseshaknya Vaidivarungi Ha Kamitwala Nirdeshan Watabai Eraja Pratipatia Tirane Vela Kriat Makali E Pratipatia Elisin Kriat Makiri Manisa Pida Wata Patvicha Muslim Janata Vagi, Lanka Andu was in Samava as the city of Tabai, Metuling Apex Sakra. In Samara Namata, another way, Sayani, Raja, Mabia, Kisivitakat may go to be Rajapak Janadi with Tumagi, who this upon that Yakiti do and demi, a Upadis do die against in Dutabai, Veradi Manusagatia, it would take a Samava in the light naked, eight Badagat. The Cabinet of Ministers has also approved the submission of a draft bill to amend the online safety bill which was passed earlier this year to Parliament for approval after publishing it in the Government Gazette. Additionally, it has been decided to submit a draft bill to amend the country's national minimum wage to Parliament for approval following clearance from the Attorney General. With that, let's review other Cabinet decisions made during the week. During this week's cabinet meeting, approval was given to award the contract to lease two vessels owned by the Ceylon Shipping Corporation to MS Wallen Shipping Private Limited, a Singapore-based company, for a period of three years. The vessels MV Ceylon Breeze and MV Ceylon Princess will be leased on a time frame lease basis with commercial management for the periods 2024 to 2025 and 2026 to 2027 based on recommendations from the Technical Evaluation Committee and Standing Procurement Committee. In another decision, the Cabinet of Ministers approved amendments to the Inland Revenue Act No. 24 of 2017. This decision follows the observation that the government has incurred losses of approximately 73 billion rupees to date due to the excessively long appeal process of the Inland Revenue Department, which spans around three years. The legal draftsman has been instructed to prepare a draft, introducing appropriate amendments to expedite this process. Additionally, the Cabinet passed a decision to gazette and present amendments to the Online Security Act No. 9 of 2024 to Parliament, incorporating suggestions from field experts. The initial approval for preparing the draft bill to amend the Online Security Act was granted in February this year and the Attorney General has cleared the prepared draft bill for submission. In the meantime, the Attorney General has provided clearance for a draft bill aimed at revising the National Minimum Wage of Workers Act No. 3 of 2016. The revision proposes an increase in the minimum national wage for private sector employees to 17,500 rupees and the national daily wage to 700 rupees. The Cabinet of Ministers has approved the publication of this draft bill in the Government Gazette and its subsequent submission to Parliament for approval. Minister of Labour and Foreign Employment Manu Shananaikara revealed that no Sri Lankans have been affected so far by the clashes between students and the Bangladesh government. Speaking in Parliament, the Minister said that the Foreign Ministry is ready to make the necessary interventions if a situation arises where they have to be repatriated to Sri Lanka. Bangladesh, Loku, Prashna Godakata, Mulvela, a Prashna Teka, Perate, Adiapane Labana, Tarun Pitisava, Game Rekia, World Gihila in a Perate, Yatikian Munai, Prashna, Gatuna called Muhuna, then Siduela, the Kieniko, Tumahola, Balatino, then at Ape, Kisidu, Sri Lanka, Kikuta. I want to inform you that no Sri Lankans have been affected by the situation in Bangladesh. 
If a situation arises where they have to be repatriated to Sri Lanka, the Foreign Ministry will make the necessary interventions. With the situation in Bangladesh, what we can remember is that a similar situation existed in Sri Lanka two years ago. The President's house and office were stormed, people were assaulted and parliamentarians were killed. Attempts were made to set the parliament on fire and put democracy in danger. However, President Ranil Vikramasinghe managed to control the situation without letting it reach an extent similar to that of Bangladesh. We have to extend our gratitude to him. Former Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison says it is crucial for countries in the Global South, including Sri Lanka, to protect their sovereignty amid the rapidly changing geopolitical landscape. Speaking at a discussion in Colombo, the former Australian Prime Minister went on to say that Sri Lanka's participation in multilateral forums will be important in its efforts to navigate international relationships. Colombo-based think tank geopolitical cartographer hosted former Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison in Colombo for a talk titled Australia and the Indian Ocean. Following his keynote address, the former Australian Prime Minister participated in a discussion with geopolitical cartographer co-patron and former president of the Maldives, Mohamed Nasheed. When it comes to the Global South, they've also been impacted by this new world. The Global South, in my view, they do need to protect their sovereignty. And they do need to ensure that whatever arrangements they enter into, be it trade, security or otherwise, that they are interests that serve their national interests and do not reduce their choices and do not create obligations upon them uh, which limit their options and to not be coerced or leveraged. And I think countries like Australia try and is empower those, like Sri Lanka in particular, to be able to realise what their full potential is and to help them navigate that pathway in what is a much more complicated world. If Sri Lanka and the Maldives have multipolar foreign policy, would that be an issue? You ask me whether they can participate in a whole range of different multilateral fora. Of course they can. And I think the advent of a lot of these minilateral fora is very positive. The, the reason why it's positive is it gives more and more forums for groups to get together in areas of common interest and pursue cooperation. So countries that exist right across the spectrum in this polarity that we have today, that provides more opportunities to resist the more calamitous outcomes which would otherwise form because groups would just fall into two camps. Sri Lanka can have the Hambantha port given to China and Sri Komali port given to the US, for instance. What do I think Sri Lanka should do? It should do what's in its national interest and it should not enter into arrangements that compromise its national interests, compromise its security, compromise its partnerships. Sri Lanka, where it has wonderful relationships with others and explains what it's doing, that should lead to an outcome where they're not disadvantaged. But where such arrangements are not transparent, which on the surface seem to compromise their national interests, which potentially can lead to their coercion, well, it's not strange that freedom-loving countries would be concerned for them. These countries should be sovereign, they should be in the best possible position to lift the living standards and the health and well-being of their populations, and they should not be subject to coercive powers of major apex states. A recent survey conducted on household drinking water quality by the Department of Census and Statistics revealed that 20.3% of the household population in Sri Lanka lacked a basic drinking water supply. According to the key findings of the survey, nearly one-third of the household population had access to a safely managed drinking water service located on premises, constantly available whenever needed and free from faecal contamination. The survey also revealed that 68.6% .6 of the people in the urban sector Nearly 28.2% of the people in the rural sector and only 3.1% of people in the estate sector use safely managed drinking water sources. Meanwhile, the survey reports showed 6.3% of the population do not have access to at least basic sanitation service and only 1.9% of the household population used sanitation facilities connected to sewers. The survey also noted that 88.7% of the household population only had access to a limited sanitation service. 
Star Dishwash Delhi Hill Indul Basu in Sede Star Dishwash Magic Topic Welcome back. Now in your business news, the Export Development Board reports that Sri Lanka's export performance in June amounted to 1.03 billion US dollars, recording an increase of 2.58% compared to a year earlier. The EDB says the export performance is also an increase of 1.97% compared to the exports of May this year. According to the EDB, the increase was mainly due to the increase in earnings from export of apparel and textiles, tea, rubber-based products, coconut-based products, food and beverages and spices and concentrates. Among Sri Lanka's top 10 export markets, the United States, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, France, Canada and China markets show positive growth in the month of June 2024 and the cumulative period from January to June 2024 compared to a year earlier. Exports to India and Pakistan, which accounts for 6.8% of total merchandise exports, decreased by 2.6%. 4% to 437.36 million US dollars during the period of January to June 2024 compared to the corresponding period of the previous year. Exports to the European Union, which accounts for 24% of Sri Lanka's exports, decreased by 5.28% year on year in June 2024. However, exports to the EU increased by 0.02% during the cumulative period of January to June this year. The estimated value of services exports for the month of June 2024 was 323.13 million US dollars, recording an increase of 39. 0.05% over the corresponding period last year. During the first half of this year, cumulative merchandise exports increased by 3.87% to 6.98 billion US dollars compared to the same period last year. The estimated value of services exports is expected to increase by 12.28% to 1.67 billion US dollars during the first half this year. Consequently, total exports for the first half of this year, including both merchandise and services, were recorded at 7.7 .7 billion US dollars, a 5.57% increase over the same period last year. The government has decided to implement a program to provide interest relief from the General Treasury for pawn advances obtained on or before the 30th of June 2024 on an individual basis. In a statement, the government cited the severe economic crisis faced by citizens which has led to an increased trend of pawning gold jewellery in recent times. It has been observed that pawn advances outstanding amounting to 210 billion rupees in 2019 have escalated to 571 billion rupees by March 2024 marking a growth of 172%. As a response, the government has decided to grant interest relief capped at a maximum of 10% annually for pawn advances not exceeding 100,000 rupees obtained from licensed banks on or before the 30th of June 2024 on an individual basis. The Colombo Bourse closed in green today as a result of price gains in counters such as Melstacorp, Richard Pierce and Company and Cargill's with the turnover crossing 540 million rupees. The benchmark All Share Index settled 0.50% up at 11,900 or 11,597.19 points rather, while the S&P Sri Lanka 20 edged up by 0.36% to close at 3,368.66 points. Mixed interest was observed in National Development Bank, John Keel's Holdings and Haley's, whilst retail interest was noted in Nation Lanka Finance, SMB Leasing and Industrial Asphalts. Trading volume on the index meanwhile rose to 55 million shares from the 35 million shares during the previous session. The banking sector was the top contributor to the market turnover, while the food, beverage and tobacco sector came in second. Foreign participation in the market remained at subdued levels with foreigners closing as net sellers. And with that, we wrap up tonight's edition of First at Nine. We'll join you tomorrow with the latest in Sri Lanka and from around the world. Thank you and have a good night.